Cecile and Vanessa, welcome to the Way Champions podcast. We're so excited to have you both on for an amazing hour or so on uh, women in coaching, which is such a, a critical, critical topic uh, and something we discuss on here often, but not enough. And so welcome to the Way Champions, both of you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Same. Yeah. Honored to be asked. Thank you. Awesome. Well, let's uh, let's dive in and just um, to sort of set the stage for our conversation today. If uh, we'll start with you, Cecile, and maybe just talk about your background, and then Vanessa will have you jump on and sort of talk about y- your journey in sport uh, that led you to today, and uh, and uh, we'll sort of set the foundation that way. So, Cecile, go ahead, jump in. Well, as you can tell by my hair color. I'm a little bit older, so this could take a while. <laughs> but I uh, I was an athlete in high school. I was, you know, played before Title IX uh, in, in the early 70s. And then I got to coach at Florida State University as the head coach in 1976. I was 22 years old. And I was fortunate to be here, spent my whole career here coaching. And uh, after I retired from coaching volleyball, then I uh, became a faculty member because I had worked on my PhD in sport management while I was coaching. Mm-hmm. And then another 15 years uh, as a teacher and a professor and just loved that. I retired in 2015 in theory, but I still uh, you know, teach a class online once a semester for the school. Uh, I've served as chair of the USA Volleyball Board and you know, done a variety of other things was president and uh, one of the founders of this We Coach organization. So I'd love to stay involved with them. My latest uh, job, I just came out of retirement. I'm now serving as a vice president of the Pro Volleyball Federation. It's a new professional league that we're going to start. And uh, our first serve will be in 2024, early Mm. 2024. So that's what I'm working on now. How exciting, because I just watched a documentary on starting the professional lacrosse league, and it didn't look fun. I might need to get, I might need to watch that. <laughs> I just, we just spent two hours this morning because we're making up our own rules. You know, everything's from, we can make the ball square. It's, it's kind of intense, but it's fun. Uh, it's, that's awesome. And let's not yada yada over um, your, your, the book that you edited winning ways of women coaches, which we're going to discuss at length here as well. So you got that on your plate as well. Yes. And that, well, yeah, I've had a couple of those on my plate and I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're going to talk about that process, but I'll take you through that. Okay. Awesome. And uh, Vanessa, go ahead, talk, talk about your journey and then up and then tell people a little bit about we coach and what you do. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, Cecile is one of the busiest people I know. She makes me <laughs> tired trying to keep up with her, but this is an honor. Such a great friend of mine and mentor, longtime mentor. We first crossed paths when I was a student athlete at Florida State. So Cecile, this is an honor to, to, to spend some time here. Uh, I grew up originally in South Florida, and uh, I credit my dad for inspiring me to get into sport and encouraging me to try a number of different sports. And then that led to the opportunity to, to play basketball and also a year of track at Florida State University. Um, after I finished my playing career, uh, I had the opportunity to then work at what I like to say is every level of collegiate athletics. It started at the ACC office in championships and then I had the opportunity to move to Indianapolis and work at the NCAA national office in academic and membership affairs. And that is essentially the the equivalent of compliance on -hmm. campus. And seven years at the NCAA then brought me back uh, to my alma mater, Florida State. And I spent 12 years in administration at FSU, um, overseeing sports, overseeing a number of different departments during my time there. And just tremendous experience and opportunities. And and Cecile mentioned it. So we have a couple of FSU alums, Cecile included, who were very instrumental in starting what is now known as We Coach, uh, originally was known as the Alliance of Women Coaches. And our organization started by first offering Women Coaches Academies back in 2003. So this is actually our 20th anniversary of Mm -hmm. Academy. And um, when the opportunity about a year ago came came about that they were looking for a new CEO of We Coach, uh, just my familiarity with the organization, the FSU influence from some of my uh, close friends that helped to found the organization, 
And I just thought there's no better time than now with everything happening in our world and our country to try to advance women and people of color to diversify sport. I just thought there was unlimited uh, potential uh, with our organization. So um, it's been about a year here with We Coach. We serve women coaches, all sports, all levels of sports. Mm. And so right now we're, we're at um, over 8,300 uh, people in our community, um, coaches, administrators, essential staff, and that range from 39 different sports are represented in our community and starting with youth, club, middle and high school sports on up through college, pro, national, even some international coaches. Mm-hmm. And it's been a blast uh, what we've been able to do this past year. Mm, it's amazing. And I don't want to uh, let you uh, yada yada over the fact that you were the athletic director for a while at Florida State University and one of the, the few in FBS, Jerry and I had Sandy Barber on last year, who's just incredible. And the, the a discussion about the challenges of that and the challenges of leadership. So I'm not going to let you skip over that important part of your biography, because I think it's incredible to have, have you on with your massive experience. Why, why do we need, this is, goes out to either of you. Why do we need this, um, emphasis and this focus really specific reaching out to to women in in coaching i mean i always say to organizations i work with they say we can't find coaches i'm like where are the moms <laughs> like you know they're the ones who usually don't do it i'll start maybe and yeah sure um you know it's a critically important um it, it's really important that these young girls these young women have leaders who look like them that they can relate to. Not to say that we don't need men. We absolutely need both. And and my belief is there's room enough for both. And we're at our absolute best when everyone is represented in the room. I think where maybe some people don't realize is here we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of Title IX. 50 years ago, we had more than double the number of women coaching women's sports. There were over 90% women coaching back in the 70s, women's Mm -hmm. sport. And we've seen this exponential decline uh, to where now, if you look across all of NCAA divisions one, two, and three, there's about an average of 41% women coaching women's sports in those divisions and only 5% women roughly coaching men's sports. Mm -hmm. So we exist that we coach to try to move those numbers back the other way. And so through year round professional growth and leadership programs, we're trying to recruit, advance and retain more women in this profession so that those young girls, those young women, if the, if she can see her, she can be her. Mm. Love it. Cecile. Well, didn't she just present that nicely? I mean, yeah, I, she did great. I don't want you to have I, to follow that. I don't want to mess that up. Don't make me speak after Vanessa. But, you know, when I first started, you know, my salary was $3,000 and then it went up a little bit. And, you know, and a lot of men went, hmm, not, not really interested. Then things really started to take off. And, and while I think the female athletes really prospered from Title IX and opportunities, uh, men became much more interested in women's sports. And, and I, I think it's just because it was paying a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And so the opportunity for them to be able to coach men's teams or women's teams, you know, they had the whole 100% of teams they could coach. Women seem to just focus on thinking they can coach women. And we are thankfully now seeing more and more women knowing that they can coach men, for example, Rachel Balkovec and, you know, and Jen Welters, some of the, I mean, it's just, it's important and they're just as good in that area, but we kind of limited ourselves to just a small segment. So mm-hmm. really important that you see women in the role and who's doing the hiring. Mm-hmm. Again, a lot of times it's a male athletic director that says, Hey, I know this guy and he knows a guy and all, you know, there you are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we just had but the how- first, the first uh, um, NCAA champion at University of Chicago, men's soccer this past fall which was amazing as well to see yeah. and watch and just to see I, I just remember watching the videos after the game the genuine love between players and coach and everything there it's like that's just coach that's coach it's not I just got goosebumps listening to that whole story yeah. but it's true I mean yeah. of course they know the sport of course they know how to work with people of course they're leaders 
Yeah. And uh, if people listen to them and give them a chance, uh, you know, they're just fabulous. Mm-hmm. Now, we're let me just tell you on the other it. end that NCAA Division I women's volleyball mm-hmm. has never had a female coach win. Mm. Yet. I was wondering. But yeah, It's heartbreaking that, you know, they get close, but they're not quite sometimes at those top level schools that fund them, you know, the where they need to, to win. Mm. So I'm hanging in there till that happens. Oh, nice. Sorry, Vanessa, were you saying something there? Yeah, John, you mentioned um, University of Chicago's uh, coach that won the national championship in D3 men's soccer, Julianne Sitch. She'll be speaking at our academy this summer. So we're nice. really excited to have her pour into our coaches and thrilled for what she's been able to achieve there in Chicago. Yeah, it was such a such a huge, um, huge moment. You know, I and, and I want to let Jerry jump in here in a sec, but I do want to sort of get one more question on sort of this idea of why do we need we coach? Why do we need this? And I remember um, a couple of years ago speaking to Kristen Diefenbach from West Virginia University, and she was talking about women in coaching. And she she just told a funny story, and I, it's worth repeating. She said, you know, I get um, female coaches who contact me for advice on applying for an assistant coaching job, right? And she says, I look at their resume and I'm like, why are you applying for the assistant? You should be applying for the head coaching job, right? They undersell themselves. And she goes, meanwhile, I'll get a guy who has played fantasy football who thinks he should be the next head coach at West Virginia University. And she just, she's just like, and and I would agree with that. I see that all the time of like, you know, and so that's something just cultural, isn't it? I, I think it is. I mean, I think women think we've got to check every box. Mm. And, you know, if it says five years experience, you know, they're going five years, everything. And they just go, well, I don't quite meet this one. And I don't know if our confidence level is low or we just, but we've just got to have more confidence and go for it. If you want to do it, you've got to believe in yourself and, and apply for those positions. But I agree. I've received applications from people who said, I'm the GA at you know Texas a and I'd like to be a head coach in the pro league. And I'm going, huh? That's, <laughs> that's not going to happen. But, yeah. but they just, if you don't apply, you're not going to get the job. So I appreciate that. Right. Uh, watching how they operate. And I wish I were more like that. Yeah. Interesting. Vanessa. Yeah. You're, you're right about the research and the tendencies that women need to be checking every box before they'll apply. And that's, what's so special about our community is at we coach, you'll find many women in our community might be the only female head coach or the only female coach period on their campus, on their, at, at their school. And so we provide this community of support because there are there there are some unique challenges that women face not only in coaching but um, you know in any industry that you that you that you work and so we try to help these women navigate and offer best practices so that they can successfully uh, address and navigate those challenges that they face um, mm. challenges like we work very closely with Dr. Nicole Lavoy and her mm-hmm. Tucker Center for Research mm-hmm. on Girls and Women in Sport. And she recently conducted a study asking women coaches why you were offered the job. Why didn't you say yes? And a lot of times it comes down to support Mm. that they've either received and done their research and received indication that they may not receive the support they need to be successful on that campus or pay. Mm. The unequal pay issues has a significant impact on the ability for women to kind of advance in this profession. And so when they're doing the same job, but are being paid a third or a fourth of what their male counterparts are being paid, it has significant impact on their willingness to take on that role. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're here to try to help address and navigate some of those issues. Mm-hmm. And just, Jerry, the, oh, yeah, just the power, the feeling of being around women. I mean, we're, we're all around men all the time and mixed groups, but when you walk into an NCA Women Coaches Academy, and it's a hundred women coaches. It, look at Vanessa's smile. It's just like you go, my people. Mm-hmm. I mean, and that's just the feeling that everyone gets. And it gives them so much strength to turn to somebody that's in field hockey or basketball. And, you know, you're just, you just feel it. It's, it's just an incredible, one of the most unique feelings I've ever had. Mm. Yeah, Jerry, thanks for sharing that, Cecile. We yeah. We we are proud to say that Nicole's staff, Dr. Lavoie's staff at yeah. the Tucker Center also does research to see 
once they go through our NCA Women Coaches Academy, are they still coaching? And the data is showing 85% plus of these women who are graduates. We're now, this is our 20th anniversary of our academies. And we've had over 2,100 women graduate from these academies over the last 20 years. We're on, this year we'll be welcoming class 52. And the data shows where this, this program is helping to keep women in the profession higher than the national average. And we're really proud to share that. That's amazing. Jer Jerry's listening attentively, but yeah, I always know when he has yeah. this look on his face, like he's got to ask something. So Jerry, I've got to jump in. I just have <laughs> to jump in. I want to sort of switch gears a little bit. Uh, I'm really enjoying listening to this conversation. It fills in a lot of empty spaces that I've always wondered about. I've been doing this work for over 45 years and uh, worked with uh, so many female coaches that you write about in your wonderful book. Uh, and uh, what I what I've discovered when I was early on in this profession was a lot of the women, a lot of the women coaches would always reference their learning uh, to a man to a men's coach, and they would always like Jeannie, Gino, Oriema, Gino, uh, or Anson, Dorrance, uh, Carolina, and so forth, and. Uh, Men have a lot to teach, and you sort of alluded to that. Uh, human beings have a lot to teach, and women have a lot to teach. So for those listeners out there who are really interested in understanding this concept, I want to know what you think is the gift, the gifts, the amazing gifts that women bring as leaders, as coaches, that uh, the man just doesn't. And the man needs to learn that. To be a full coach as a male, you have to have what that female has in 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 her uh, 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 a toolkit, emotionally, uh, psychologically, and and all these. I'd love for each of you to speak to that issue about what we can, what we need to learn from women coaches, so we can be better coaches. Period. Well, let, let me start, and this is just kind of a, a little bit of how we got to where we are today. I had written a volleyball book and helped edit a volleyball book with human kinetics. Mm -hmm. And in my entire coaching career, I always read books and every one of them was by a male coach. And I read every football book, golf book, basketball <laughs> book, and all brilliant. And I learned so much, but I said to the editors, I said, you know, this was fun. I enjoyed this, but gosh, I would love to get a book together to know what the top women coaches think about certain things. And they went, wow, interesting concept. So back in 2005, I put together a book called She Can Coach. Mm -hmm. Same kind of format as this. And a good friend of mine and a mentor was Pat Summit. So mm -hmm. I talked to Pat and I said, would you write a chapter in this book? And she said, oh, I don't write. I don't type. I can't do this. I said, perfect. I'll fly up. We'll go through the whole thing. You don't have to type a thing. And then, and so then we talked about a chapter. She said, staff organization sounds interesting. And I said, okay. So we went through and designed that chapter. She thought the staff organization should be her with a circle of people around her. And I went, actually, Pat, I'm just going to tell you, that's not a good way to be organized. I know you've won a thousand games, but let me see if I can help you get the right structure. So she, we put it together. She said, this sounds great. This is just like me. So once I got her, I could get anybody else mm -hmm. to agree. And, and so we got 20 different women to write about a variety of things in from their point of view. And it, we, I just thought it was going to be helpful for us to hear that voice. And it was. Mm -hmm. And then we just came back and uh, during COVID, right before COVID started, I wanted this, you know, we did this next project because we thought it was, you know, women were really coming on strong now and it was going to be important. So that's, uh, that's the philosophy and the reason why we did this book and why we thought it was important. Mm. Yeah, I, I, uh, I get that, but I also think that there's a lot of people out there, hopefully they will read your book. They might not. So what they need is they need a shot in the arm. They need to know like I can feel it. I feel the difference. It's palpable to me. It's not intellectual. It's something that I feel when I'm working with a side by side with a female coach versus a man's coach, a men coach. And 
what are those specific different what is it that i'm feeling is 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 well, you is, tell me what you're feeling I'm, I'm interested to hear your view if you i mean really if okay you, so so what's here but but the, the thing that i'm feeling most is the ability to really almost master the relationship game there's a connection there's a caring that I sense. There's there's a lot of love. Now, I also, if a coach is going to hire me, they know that's the way I think anyway. So the men's coaches that I work with, like Anson and others, they, they tend to have that ability to, to go there. But there are so many men out there, is what I'm looking at, that don't get that yet. And, 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 Women to empower women. Uh, I think there are not enough women out there that realize that they have this gift, almost naturally, and it it it's palpable. You could feel it. You could sense it, and and uh, that connection. You know, winning, like Steve Kerr, uh, when I asked him the question, like, what was the most important game you ever won on the road to your first championship? Without even a thought, he said. Oh, Jerry, that's easy. It's the relationship game. He gets it. That's why he's so successful. Not because he's a male coach, because he's a human being who has these feminine traits, characteristics that we can feel palpably. Whether you're a guy or a girl, it doesn't matter. Or a woman, it doesn't matter. And and so I just wanted to open up that conversation to see where we would go with this, but you know, well, I, a- I think uh, a lot of times when I do a coaching clinic, you know, I'll start out with what do you coach? And they'll yell out basketball or volleyball. And I'll say, no, you coach people mm-hmm. and you've got to approach it from that angle, because if you don't coach people, you know, the ball never did anything by itself. You've got to have the connection with the athlete, uh, of course, the knowledge, but then the connection and how you do that with each athlete is different. But I do think women are more sensitive. They certainly understand how important it is uh, to build confidence in the athletes. And that's something I'm not sure, you know, we find the, the male coach might know, but women, you know, just really need more confidence. And so I think women coaches work hard to provide that for them. Mm-hmm. Vanessa, I agree, Jerry. Coach Renaud. Yeah, I agree with both of you, Jerry, Cecile, you're spot on. I think women do have some innate uh, gifts for the soft skills, the human skills, the relationships, communication, generational understandings is huge. It's all these different skills, the leadership skills that we're trying to, um, you know, help educate our, our community about. But I also think some of those strengths that women have when a, a woman coach gets fired up, uh, it might, you know, uh, raise their voice because we're so known for our human skills. If we get a- aggressive, if we if we try to get these student athletes fired up, sometimes that isn't received the same way as it is when when a when a man a male coach is good point yelling mm-hmm. or raising their voice or giving that same stern instruction in the spirit of firing up their athletes. It's just the gender bias plays into that a little bit. And that's where I think we do see, because women are known for certain strengths, then when we, uh, in in a coaching setting, it can be received differently by athletes uh, compared to if if a male male coach was uh, communicating in the same way. Yeah, I think, yeah, I I just want to say, I think that's a huge point. And And Jerry, I'll let you go. But I, I see this all the time that the same actions by a male coach are considered leadership or whatever, and yeah. it's considered being bossy or a worse B word by a female coach, and the same exact thing. And I see that all the time. So Jerry, go ahead. Well, we're all trapped in this. Uh, uh, we're incarcerated in our hearts and our minds, and. Uh, uh, you know, I'll never forget the time I was working at Maryland with Cindy Timshaw. I you might have heard of her. Good friends of Missy Maharg, who you interviewed. Uh, yes. Missy's also a very good friend. I worked with her for years. And I can remember the men's head lacrosse coach coming to me and saying, 
my God, you guys have won how many consecutive championships together? I want a piece of that. So I went into the, uh, the room with the team. We had this all planned out. And the first thing we did was we stood in a circle and we, we all held hands. Oh, my God. You can't believe his reaction. <laughs> it, it was like I was going to change their whole gender. I mean, it, this was not acceptable to him. I was never invited back. You know, and, I, I traveled. I'm sorry. Did you finish your story? No, no, no. I'm, it's just a conversation. Well, no, I, I traveled with a men's. I was a team leader for a men's under 21 world uh, to go to the world championship. So there were th obviously three male coaches and I was the female team leader. And so we lost to Russia in a very tight match. We went into the locker room as our first match. And so the head coach just tore into him, as you can imagine. The other assistant just tore into them, as you can imagine. And then they turned to me and said, Cecile, would you like to make any cut? Would you like to say anything? And I said, yeah, but it's just going to sound so different. And it's, you know, and the guy, the, the young athletes went, thank you, please. Can someone just talk to us normally? And so I, you know, I don't understand sometimes why male coaches feel like they've just got to go off the rails when they can get the point across and they, but if they just feel like that's how they're supposed to act. And I've had coaches say, you know, I treat my, talk to my male, male athletes differently. And I said, why, why yeah. can't you be respectful of them? And let's not teach yeah. them that kind of behavior. And I think, I think a lot of women feel that they have to imitate that kind of thing to be successful because those men have been quote unquote successful mm -hmm. when indeed that's that man that needs to adapt some of those female characteristics. Right. And right. we have, I guess what I'm saying here is for the coaches listening, you all need to get a balance in your life. You need to have a little of both, you know, and, and you have to be kind. You have to be gentle. You have to be caring. But if you love someone, you'll get on them too. I mean, isn't that love? Mm -hmm. Like if I demand from you and you can be demanding, but I think where we draw the line for me in my work is, you know, you've got to be kind to people. You've got to be uh, compassionate. You have to have all those other, what <laughs> Vanessa, you call the soft stuff. To which I say, yeah, soft is strong. I mean, let's look at water. It's the softest substance you can touch. You can actually put your hand through it, pull it out and don't see anything. And But it wears away rock and it lights up cities. And 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 so we need that balance. And uh, I'm so glad you two are here so that I can throw that out there and have a well, good I conversation about it. love listening to how you think about this because it's, it's really true and it's amazing. And uh, I think we're just trying to teach our athletes how to be good people. And so let's treat them like good people and show them how that leadership uh, should be. Mm -hmm. Cecile, I nominate Jerry for a chapter in, in edition number three of the next book you're, you're that, coming out that with. That sounds like a great well, idea. Let me, let me just throw out, when I would, came up with this idea for this book and I was telling some people, I'm going to do a book uh, with the top, and I mean, they had to be top top women coaches sure. in like 20 different sports. And they said, oh, Anson Dorrance. And I went, no. Mm -hmm. And then they said, Gino Ariam, and I went, no. And mm -hmm. then they said, I forgot who coached it, Ma Micah Andrea at, at Arizona Softball. And I went, no. Nope. Okay, <laughs> there is a reason I need to do this book, because when you think of the top women coaches, it was, they just shouted out men's names. And I went, okay, it's yeah. getting done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, <clears throat> there's another piece to this that I think is important. And Cecile, you kind of, you asked Jerry a little while back about, well, what do you think? And I think one of the things that I learned um, when I started coaching um, sort of high school girls age teams. And I, I coached a assistant coach of a division one college soccer team for a while, women's as well. And um, was that, you know, guys like you roll a ball out and they compete and they kick the pieces out of each other. And then they're all bonded at the end of that. And that's not always the case, not often the case with um, with female teams and that building that bond. And, and I think um, women's co women coaches intuitively understand this, that we got to get the culture right. We got to get the bond right. We got to get everyone on the same page and bought in and then we'll truly compete. And I've been amazed over the years how many male coaches who are coaching female sports at the NCAA level don't understand that, don't know that they've never considered it. Um, and, and so I think that's a big difference that I've seen is that 
from their own upbringing, female coaches understand, Hey, if, if we all hate each other, we're never going to compete. Um, in my yeah. experience, a, a couple of sayings come to mind that men battle to bond mm -hmm. and women bond to battle. Yeah. And, uh, so guys will just go after each other and then they'll go out and, you know, have a beer together and everything's great. The women, if you're not together, I mean, they're, it's just going to be awful, but I, you know, we've done a lot of coaching clinics with USA volleyball and we talk about, you know, one of our segments is team building. Mm -hmm. and uh, some of the male coaches go, I think we should take that off the schedule. That's a waste of time. And all the women in the room go, oh. <laughs> and that's why you're not doing very well. So, you know, yeah. you might want to try the team building because it's important to those athletes mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be, um, you know, severe, but just, they have got to get to know each other and feel comfortable and they will do anything for those other athletes. I mean, you know, you watch women's basketball, you know, they've always got each other's back and that's what they're going to do. And that's important. So yeah, mm -hmm. we've got to teach that. And, and every chapter in this book, while we ask them to talk about various things, we also ask them to discuss culture because we felt like that was so important. So every one of them addressed that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's critical because um, that, I mean, again, we're human beings and we want this. You know, when I started, you know, when Jerry started sliding out of doing some of the team development work and he introduced me to some of the coaches who were asking the work and I've taken over. You did say to me, Jerry, you said, you know, just so you know, you'll get a lot more coaches of women's teams who understand the importance of this work um, than you will men's teams. He goes, but every time you walk into the locker room of one of those men's teams, you will see 20, 30, 40 faces who have been dying for this type of connection and, and culture yeah. and bonding yeah. because yeah. they're human beings and, and they want it too. And the men's coaches and teams that understand that, they really excel. You know, I asked, I taught graduate classes and I had a lot of football graduate assistants. And so I asked him one time, do, um, do the guys ever get to design a play, like a passing play or anything like that? And they went, nope. And I said, but just think, what excitement they would have if they designed a play and the coach called it, I'll guarantee you it would work, number one, because that it's their play. And they said, that will never happen. And I thought, gosh, that's a shame. You know, it's their team. Let them be engaged in some of those things. But no, it's a lot of we're going to do the same thing every day. It's going to be monotonous and boring. And oh, I just, I, you know, and, and Nancy Stevens chapter on uh athlete-centered coaching. I mean, it's just brilliant. I mean, it has yeah, to be. Yeah. It's their team. Yeah. And the research say says there. this generation, they want to have a say. They want, and it generates more buy-in into that team culture. Mm -hmm. If just some coaches I've heard will dedicate a segment of practice where the team gets to pick what they work on. And yeah. they love it. Ownership. Designing plays, them having a say in their program has them more locked in, built in. This generation, they want to have a voice. They want to have a say in what's going on. They want to understand why they're doing what they're doing. But I think back to the point of culture, um, and she's also in our in in our book, Cecile. But Coach Coacha, Coach Lonnie Alameda at oh, Florida wow. State, just one of the best I've ever seen. I agree. We would hire new coaches at Florida State. And when we would, and they would come and ask, you know, who do I need to develop relationships with? And I tell, well, everyone, but you want to learn about building a holistic student first program culture that teaches these students, not only how to compete in the game, but to be just lifelong leaders, go see Kocha. Lonnie is phenomenal and she dedicates intentionally just as much time to the team bonding team building experience as she does to teaching them about the game of softball. Everything is tied back to how this is going to help them later on in life. And it really, I, I believe Cecile that it's really helped her achieve the success that she's had. Oh, I, at she, Florida State. she is one of the best coaches I've ever met male or female in any sport. I mean, she has got the whole package and the other thing she's got Vanessa that a lot of people don't have is she makes it fun. You know, there, there's an F word that coaches yes. need to be reminded of. The athletes need to have fun. And so she covers that in the chapter, how to focus. And then, you know, you can't just stay in that concentrated state for three hours, but how to pull out of it 
back off, have fun. And when they're on national television and, you know, the World Series, people say, why aren't men's sports like this? Why don't they have fun? You know, this is so entertaining to watch. Because the men are so afraid. Talented. They're afraid. <laughs> they are. They're afraid that if we have too much fun, we're not going to get serious. What they well, miss is like Pete Carroll. Pete Carroll, you know, like right. to do fun things, well, and he's got a lot of criticism. Well, one of the one of the top values of the Warrior organization, which I have consultancy with, Steve puts joy number one. Yeah, having fun, and and I think their record speaks okay. for themselves. But the thing is that joy. What what, what most people me- mess up with is they associate joy with like just. Oh well, well, we're having fun. Yeah, goofy, Put on the music. Not goofy, yeah. But but you know, real joy is in the execution of a well thought out plan. Mm-hmm. You know, exactly. imagine if we designed this system and we went into that final game and it all worked together. Isn't that fun? Of course, it's fun. And and so I think there's a, a lack of education and a lack of communication with with a lot of coaches that don't understand the concepts that we're talking about. I mean, every one of those. I've been part of 115 now more with John and John's work. He's brought this even higher, 115 plus uh, championship teams. Every single one of those teams had fun as one of their values. It was always that idea of what is fun? Let's define it and and let's go from there. And the other interesting thing is 80, 75% of those teams are female of those championship teams. And there's a reason for that, I believe. And it's what we're all talking about here today. And it's so important to capitalize on the feminine qualities of the the major one is they want to connect. It's important that you're my friend. It's important that we connect. I'd rather have you as a friend than an enemy. And uh, that's got to change. That's an excellent point. And I, again, I think Lonnie does that, uh, gets that out of her athletes so well and demonstrates that. And I, I just feel like I had an athlete call me one time that had gone into coaching. So she calls my office and she said, you know, see our team's not doing very well. And, you know, gives me a couple of things. And I said, what are you doing with the team to have fun? And she went, oh, crap. <laughs> okay, on. thank you. Hung up season turned around. I mean, they just forgot. Oh my gosh. Mm. And said, oh, oh, yes. Okay. I mean, you know, you just think you've got to be hard and yeah. strict and, yeah. but they, all of a sudden they relaxed and they really enjoyed it. Well, Missy, Missy Maharg used to uh, have one practice. She would never tell the kids when, when the practice was going to be this way, but they go out there and she said, leave your sticks in the locker room. And they went out there and they played soccer. Yeah. yeah. For the whole practice. Right. Oh my God. Was that fun? Next yeah. day they come back. They're raring to go to get those sticks going. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, or you give them a couple of days off that they're totally oh, yeah. And they, Duh. You know, and sometimes we think more is better as coaches. And so you practice longer. And actually, if you backed it off, I think people that are overtrained lose every time to people that are undertrained. But yeah. as long as you give them some time off and they come back in and they're fresh, mm-hmm. they're raring to go. And, and at the youth level, you've really got to make sure they have fun or they're going to get out of the sport. But that's being too soft, isn't it? <laughs> Perhaps, but I don't think so. No, no, I'm, I'm Vanessa, with it. Vanessa, let me ask you this because on this idea of joy and 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 soft, I think one of the things that I see, and this would apply to both female coaches and male coaches, is if you have that coach who focuses on relationships and the joy of the players and they lose society, the media says that's why they lost because they're not serious enough or whatever. And if you have that coach who let's just say is still channeling his or her inner bear Bryant and, um, and they lose media and society says, those athletes just aren't tough enough. And I think this is this long-term cultural bias of What does good coaching look like that's based in a decades old model of treating people like soldiers when we now have a generation that wants to be treated like artists? So I'll throw that very small question at you, Vanessa. Oh, good for Vanessa. (laughs) (laughs) I was just going to say, Phil, I might need you to help me with this one. That's a great point. 
my approach at Florida State and when I was overseeing sport programs, it was always to look at the, the full picture. And I think this is a, probably because of my own experience. My, one of the most influential human beings on my life, my college coach, Sue Semrau, who retired the day I started with We Coach. So here I'm mm-hmm. starting to support women coaches and my own coach retires that very day. Sue, she made it about fun. She made it about us as people first. And when we traveled, we'd go see the monuments in Washington, D.C. And we would, she made it very educational. So she taught, she, her mantra was, I'm going to treat you as a person first, a student second, and an athlete third. And that always resonated with me because I always brag about the exceptional student athlete experience I had. Then fast forward all these years later, and I'm now working with coaches and programs. And the first thing I always looked at wasn't, are they winning or losing, but rather, are the kids happy? Are they growing? Are they really great ambassadors for Florida State University? And a lot of that is an extension of the influence of that coaching staff and the essential staff around those young people that results in them uh, being out in the community, being involved on campus and integrated with the college life. That's all so important as we evaluate programs. And I, I talk about this all the time with peers that unfortunately, yes, it does many times come down to winning But I do believe coaches who figure out the piece of treating them as humans and students, making their teams an asset for that campus, many times that'll help prolong if you are going through a difficult period where you may not be winning as much as you would like. I I was much more apt to allow a coach more time, even during moments where they may not have been winning, if all the other aspects of their program were in really, really good order. And so I don't know if Cecile, you agree with that, but well, that was well, I, and I don't think Cecile, before you go, I don't think a lot of coaches either get that luxury from their administrators on the collegiate level or feel like they have that luxury. Yeah. They feel like, man, if we don't win, we're out the door. And some right. of them are, are at very big schools are told that directly. I mean, friends of mine who have been told, you know, we got a new AD who says he's firing the bottom 10% of all the coaches every year. Right. And, so and and how are you being evaluated? Not that the kids love you and they love each other. It's how many games did you win? And I do. I think we need more data about the length of time coaches are given and and what translates. What's that sweet spot for what translates into success in terms of the the winning column? Uh, but you know, not everyone w- w- took my approach. Um, I recognize that, but gosh, it that's where I think we do. We need more education, not only to build up these coaches to be the best leaders that they can, but also on the administrator side, the administration side of helping them understand what they should be evaluating programs on. Um, but I agree with you that not not everyone is given that opportunity, but that's where I think some education could definitely benefit in the world of sport. It's the hardest aspect, in my opinion, of our industry is when you see really good coaches, really good human beings that um, aren't retained in their, in their position. And it's mostly because they're, they're just not winning. Mm -hmm. And there's so many other great things that they're doing with those young people. Mm. Cecile. Well, yes, I have so many thoughts on this, but, uh, one of them is just about being able to motivate the athletes. And, uh, so we, we would have every year, I am sure Vanessa, your teams did this, you'd get together and your coach would say, go over there and decide what are your priorities? What are your goals for the year? So, you know, it was always number one for them was have fun. Number two, blah, blah, blah you know, when this do something. And so uh, one year I came and we were just at the top of the ACC, but we hadn't quite won a championship yet. So we got to this next year and I said, okay, what are your, you know, get your goals. So they came back over and have fun was nowhere on that. And I said, what's with that? And they went, we're over fun. We're going to win the conference, you know, championship this year. And I went, okay, now we got a team. And then they said, well, you get a tattoo if we win. <laughs> And my mother lived in town and I said to my mother, what, you know, what do you, th- should I get a tattoo? And she goes, you do whatever it takes to seal. And I went, okay. So <laughs> my mother was very competitive. So uh, we got to the championship against North Carolina and that was all they could think about was, and so I have a tattoo on my ankle <laughs> that says ACC championship. And uh, 
but you know, it's got the, the year on it, but don't, don't put the year because that was last century now already, but you know, it motivates him. And I, I talked with our baseball coach, Mike Martin, you know, he just couldn't win the world. And I said, you know, if you would think about just, you know, get a tattoo, you're at for your yeah. athletes. And he went, nope, not doing it. And I said, but I promise you, they would pull it off for you mm-hmm. because that would mean so fun for them to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They like shaving heads too. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Not that my team's won anything. This is yeah. just natural. <laughs> yeah, you might want to go somewhere else on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh <laughs> um, my gosh. Good. Yeah. Um, so I mean, we we we've talked tons about your book without really talking about the book, but one chapter that sticks out um to me is uh, a chapter, and and I I can look it up, but I won't. Just I forget who writes it on sort of coaching and raising a family. And my first thought when I read that was in a in a book um, that are uh, focused on male coaches, that would never be a chapter. Right. Um, even though it should be because yeah, finding be. that balance and whatever. But there's just all these assumptions that go into it and sort of this assumption for a female coach that, you know, you should you're also responsible for raising your family while doing all these things instead of whereas it with the male coach it's almost like um and your spouse will take care of that piece of things and so just you know thoughts about that chapter because this is a unique thing that i think female coaches face uh i we put it in there because we do have a lot of women that say i don't know if i can coach and raise a family and uh an excellent example is uh, the coach at Louisville, the women's volleyball coach at Louisville. What's her name, Vanessa? Danny. Danny, Danny yes, Kelly. Danny, Danny Busman Kelly just was in the finals, uh, was pregnant. And, you know, and we just spoke with her not too long ago, just about how, you know, it takes, you've really got to be organized. You've got to know what's going on, but a supportive spouse that helps take care of things. But if, obviously people can do this all the time. There was one coach, a volleyball coach years ago, Terry Clemens adopted a child every time she won a national championship at Washington University. She ended up with six kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, but yes, I mean, there's no question that you can do that. You've got to have people that can help. And the more universities that uh, put things out there for child care, uh, you know, maybe travel with a nanny, whatever, whatever they need to, to make them feel comfortable. But there are a lot of sacrifices and, you know, everybody wants to have their mom at their games. And so they miss a lot of that. But, you know, we've all missed a lot of that. And when you're in coaching, you know, everybody misses a lot of things with their family. Mm. We, um, Jerry and I just had on, and I don't know this necessarily would have crossed your path yet, but um, we just had on a woman named Lauren Fleshman on the podcast here, um, who just wrote an incredible book called Good for a Girl about... Mm-hmm um females in sports and hers is more focused on the way that the way that we coach women in sport and how you know she was a professional runner and an NCAA champion at Stanford and she just she talks about in this book how all the research in sports science is done on males and and the idea that uh, you know when when males hit puberty, they tend to go on a pretty steady upward trajectory while many female athletes will plateau for a while as they grow into and get used to a very different body than they just had. Right. Um, and, and just how we need more research and we need sort of a, a better understanding of how female athletes develop and how to coach them. And, and never mind all the body issue and weight issue and things like that, that she talks about as well. But I thought it was a really fascinating perspective that I didn't know much about was just that we base so much of what we call as normal as, well, this is the science on men. So this just applies to women as well. Any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I mean, there, there, and I, I taught a class here when I was uh, at the university, it was called gender issues. And it was gender issues in sport. And one day, the you know, primarily faculty, all men, and they all said, uh, you know, we probably can take this class off. Don't we don't need to teach this anymore? And I said, newsflash, there's two genders. And they went, men have issues. And I went, okay, do you want me to go over them now? Of course, they have issues in sport, and you know, we've got to pay attention to that as well. And so they're, you know, they're separate. But uh, a lot of things that men do, you know, we've got to get a handle on that. And then the women, you know, it's different, but you've got to understand each, um, each other's gender and what goes on. 
And, and if you don't, uh, you know, I'll just go ahead and have this conversation. You know, we need to talk about menstrual synchronization. Mm -hmm. And when you mention that to a man, they go, what are you talking about? And the fact that, you know, a group of women that are closely associated will all resort to that same cycle freaks them out. And they go, can't you fix that? And you go, no, you cannot fix that. But that will be part of your working with women. So make sure you understand that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Vanessa, John, yeah. we just had a video chat today, just before this with Gatorade performance partner. Uh, they had two of their experts um, present on uh, strategies, energy and fueling strategies for the female athlete. We talked about menstruation and, and we had some of our men in our community on the call too. And they said, we couldn't wait for this one because it's so important that the men understand some of the unique dynamics when they're coaching women athletes. Um, so I, I, I agree completely with um, your point about the research. As we apply for grants, our organization in every single one of those applications is also asking for uh, part of the funding to expand research. Mm -hmm. uh, we were fortunate to have a, a grant to support our We Amplify program for our women coaches of color. Part of that grant funding will also then work with the Tucker Center to generate more much needed research on women coaches of color. But I'll tell you, we haven't had updated data on youth and high school sports, mm. particularly women coaching at those levels in 10 years. And so that's another priority for us as, as we look at what data is available to us, um, securing some additional funding to, to be able to update some of this data because it's, it's so necessary, it's needed. Right. And, and while it's, you know, we wanna see more women coaches, I, I would like to say a diverse staff you know, if you have two or three women and a male coach, I mean, it's perfect because you just all see things differently and you, you, I think you get better answers. You do a better job of coaching. And so I, you know, I always encourage that and always tried to do that myself. Mm. Yeah. I love it. And I think you would see that much more on the women's side than you would on the men's side, hiring a female staff. And, and I think we've talked a lot about college here, but I think that trickles down as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Oh, there's so much more we could go, but we also want to be respectful wow. of your time. We blew through almost an hour here. Um, is there anything, and we'll start with you, Vanessa, and then um, we'll give you the last word. Um, <clears throat> Cecilia, anything you wish we had brought up, anything you wish we had asked you that we didn't, that you think is really important for people to understand around this book, around the, wor the work that we coach is doing? Anything that you want to kind of leave our listeners with here? I don't know if it was anything you didn't ask, but I'd say representation matters. And we, we need all of us to set this next generation of leaders on, on the right path. And so really appreciate the opportunity, Cecile. Really grateful to you and the 20 contributing authors for this resource that you've provided to our community um, it's now got over 2,000 copies sold, so we're really excited about that. Nice. But thank you so much, and thank you for the opportunity to, to have us on. Yeah. Cecile? Well, I, you know, it's so fun to put together a project like this, although it is a group project of 20 people that are really busy. And so it, we started this before COVID, and, and then COVID started, and so I could reach everybody. I had no problems talking to Tara Vanderveer, you know, everybody. And then all of a sudden... Uh, they started, we started coming out of COVID. And while all of our authors were so successful, now Tara is getting ready to win a national championship. So I'm, you know, totally off base, can't get in touch with her. Uh, Lonnie Alameda is in the finals of the national championship, leaving to go coach in Tokyo the next day. And I went, she can't leave the country yet. I've got to talk. But they were all so successful and they all volunteered their time and efforts. And so everything, every profit that was made off of this uh, was given to we coach and so that's you know that's why we feel like the sales are important and mm -hmm. uh, we want to just support that organization and our, our women coaches out there but let me a lot of men reading the book let me let me tell you the power of a woman coach like tara okay nobody knows this but when we we had her actually as a guest speaker for our annual transformative coaching conference every year and uh i said to her i said will you be able to make it and she said, uh, yeah, the season will be over and it'll be perfect, perfect timing, what have you. I said, 
but I forgot to tell you there's one condition to have you on and that is you have to win the championship mm -hmm. and she laughed and what have you and she went on to win the, the championship the national <laughs> championship so she willed that I I'm convinced to this day mm -hmm. that she wanted to be at our conference she mm -hmm. wanted to That's win right. that title and she did it because of who she is mm -hmm. with right. all of her skill set her athlete centric coaching her caring the yeah. relationship game she just she just crushes it you know right. So anyway, okay. how, how can people best find this book and, and, and grab this book? And that's, it's on your website. It is. Yes. And our, our community receives 20% off. So bonus, mm -hmm. uh, it's on our website, but also sold on the human, human kinetics webpage, mm -hmm. Amazon and major book outlets, all Barnes and Noble, you name it. But what's your website? We coach sports.org. Okay, everyone get that? Mm -hmm. WeCoachSports.org. Mm -hmm. .org. And we'll put that all in the show notes uh, as well. Uh, the book is Winning Ways of Women Coaches. Um, <clears throat> you have a copy of it there, John? I do. Also, for those watching on YouTube, up, you? here you go. Yeah. There's the book. There's Cecile's name at the bottom of the cover of the book. So and three um, pretty good coaches on the front so. and three pretty good coaches on the front for sure. So, you know, thank you both for being on such an important topic. Um, we, we've learned so much from uh, all the incredible coaches we get to interact here with, but books like this really just, I think that bring together the, the best wisdom from some of the most brilliant minds are, are so fun to read and so important. So we truly appreciate you putting this together and the work that you're both doing to grow the coaching community and better prepare the coaching community and, and get more women out there because they have so much to offer. Um, and uh, we, we truly, truly appreciate you both busy people making the time for this today. Thank you very much. Pleasure to get to talk to all of you. Vanessa, good to see you, even though we live in the same town, but uh, oh. really honored, honored to be on the show. Thank you. Same. Enjoy the conversation. Thank you, John. So we we really didn't answer many ask many questions, did we? <laughs> but we answered them all. Thanks we answered everybody. Them all. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Ooh, Jerry, that was a great conversation. Super interesting book, Winning Ways of Women Coaches, and uh, uh, you know, just a great conversation with both uh, Cecile and Vanessa. Well, this is this, this is a, a really different conversation than most john wouldn't you say and uh it, it made me feel really uh inspired because you know as you know uh the, between the two of us we do work with a lot of women coaches i have over the year uh 75 percent of the coaches i work with are female for good reason uh they tend to understand the concept that it takes to be a great coach and uh so we talked about that today which really made my heart sing and uh you know saw saw the uh saw the passion and an interest that these women have in making changes which is what way of champions podcast is all about and and so i'm i'm so thrilled that uh they can they can be there as spokespeople to uh, to promote mm -hmm. those changes you know mm -hmm. yeah and i mean to have people like you know cecile who was you know, a USA Volleyball Hall of Fame coach and and Vanessa, who now is running We Coach, but also one of the only handful ever of female athletic directors at an FBS school. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's just in incredible people with incredible knowledge to mm -hmm. talk. And, and we, we barely like scratch the surface of the items in this book and the things that the book covers. And I mean, I'll just yeah. sort of give some different chapters, right? Checking your coaching competencies written by Valerie Condos Field, the legendary UCLA gymnastics coach. And there's things about, you know, thriving and this is an assistant coach and self-awareness and strengthening the coach athlete relationship. Um, I, th I think they mentioned Nancy Stevens taking an athlete centered approach, Jen mm -hmm. Welter leading effectively and coaching people up. Mm -hmm. um, so it's about, you know, developing and managing your program, your staff and athlete engagement. It's really a, an awesome book. So chapters my, written by some of the best coaches out there. My major takeaway, John, and you can, of course, share yours. 
if it's different. But my major takeaway is our discussion that the female coach has certain characteristics that the men coaches need to adapt to be more successful. Mm -hmm. The men coaches have certain characteristics that the female needs to adapt. And basically what this really talks about is the coming together of human beings to make it a better world for the athletes mm -hmm. out there and to take the best of each gender mm -hmm. and, and, and put it together and, and see if we can become a better version of ourselves, which I mm -hmm. totally am on board with. Yeah. And just, I think my takeaway is that, you know, as a male coach to look at it from a female perspective is really eye opening because I'm going to see things that maybe I didn't grow up like that doesn't come naturally to me, things like that. And just that extra perspective is going to make me a better coach, regardless of who I'm coaching yeah. in the moment. So fantastic. Well, thank you all for listening. Um, just to remember, shout out again, August 4th, 5th and 6th, Way of Champions Conference. Uh, get signed up now. Um, we still are taking a lot of groups. So group discount, if you get five or more coaches from your school or your club, we give you 50% off, which is pretty cool. Uh, we're probably going to run out of hotel rooms soon, at least in our two hotel blocks right next to school. So if this is something that's on your agenda, get signed up uh, pretty soon. Okay. Jerry, did you have one more point there you want to add? No, I'm just okay. just very nice. happy I'm here. Uh, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, we, again, we announced you know, Phil Jackson is going to be uh, joining us and doing some teaching and, and some other great announcements coming up here as well. So anyway, listen – your influence is never neutral, as we always talk about. So um, use it wisely. Go out there, make a positive difference this week, and we'll see you again next week.